and welcome to this episode of Superhero Ethics. When a beloved animated series is turned into a live action show, a lot of things can go wrong. Some things can go really right, and in some cases there have been examples of this that are utterly beloved. In some there are ones that I love it, but nobody else does, like Cowboy Bebop. But certainly a thing that has a lot of trepidation attached to it. No more so, I think, than with the show that will be launching in just a few days after this podcast comes out, the live-action Avatar The Last Airbender. I will be doing episode-by-episode uh, episode coverage of it, probably two episodes at a time on one episode, uh, possibly with the help of some of the guests that I have on today. <laughs> but today, we're going to talk about the animated series. And we're doing this for a couple of reasons. One is because many of you may not have seen the animated series and want to have some idea of what it is going into this show. Personally, as good as I think this podcast will be, I think you'd have a lot better time hitting stop and then watching the show itself instead. But the show is going to be about 40 hours, and this podcast is going to be closer, we hope, to 60 to 90 minutes. Fingers majorly crossed because Paul is one of the guests. But also, for those who have, have seen it, this is meant to be kind of a, you know, a refresher. We haven't seen it in a while. But even more so, we're going to be discussing not a, like, oh, what do we expect from the show based on the trailers and the news... Uh, we have all been trying to, for the most part, avoid all of that, but instead just talking about what are the things that we love about this show, the animated version, that we think are kind of essential to the show and would that that will really like not work unless this is in some way explored uh, in 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 this live action. So it's kind of a primer for the live action, but without being all about the trailers and the spoilers, just being about what it is we we feel about the original show, mostly what we love, but maybe not entirely and how that can translate to live action. So I'm going to introduce each of my guests and give them a chance to not only tell you their name and who they are, but also how did they first watch this show? How did they come to it and kind of what was their first impression of it? Um, and Paul, since I've already mentioned you and your long-windedness and how you encourage my long-windedness, that's just as much my fault as yours, as uh, proven by this long-winded intro that I'm now making even more long-winded by a tangent about the long-windedness, and I'm really tempted to go on to another tangent about the tangent, but I'm just going to say, Paul, take it away. Sure. Uh, I'm Paul Christopher Hoppy, a.k.a. Zen Madman. Um, I watched this show actually for the first time in 2010 while writing, or more specifically while not writing, uh, my first book, Way of the Poker Warrior, which is like available nowhere. But <laughs> <laughs> actually, I guess you can find it on Lean Pub. I think it's on Amazon, but I don't get any royalties from that because the publisher died and i don't know it's very complicated the point i being, have a copy that'll sell for the best offer like right kick Paul has. nice nice <laughs> I, I mean there's a, i have the pdf um but so i i was like deep in a process of like trying to do something for the first time trying to learn it well you know kind of trying to like combine martial arts and poker which fits really well but also kind of doesn't or doesn't in like an obvious way necessarily and um and my wife was like, hey, do you want to watch this? I was like, yeah, sure. Um, girlfriend at the time. But we were like, I, and I just, it, the first few episodes I enjoyed. And just over time, I just liked it more and more. You know, um, I found that I identified a lot with the main character, Aang. And um, for various reasons, but, you know, among them, like the obvious sort of ones are that like, he's a vegetarian. There's not a lot of vegetarian protagonists in fiction, you know, especially in, um, either animated or, or like live action, like on screen fiction. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I liked that, but also just kind of his, his personality of, um, you know, dealing with a lot of heavy stuff. And I'd say the show more broadly also deals with a lot of really heavy stuff, you know, like war and, and genocide and, and death. And, um, but I feel like it does it all with a very light touch. And mm -hmm. I feel like it manages to find humor, not necessarily from the horrible things, but like in spite of the horrible things. And mm -hmm. there are, I, I could think of at least one specific movie that I won't name because I, I don't want to get into it, but that like, I felt like kind of tried to do that. And it felt like just a glaring mismatch and a clash that felt like awful to me. And mm -hmm. somehow I feel like the show gets away with it and actually manages to pull it off in a way that resonates with me, you know? And I think some other people probably found this movie or like other movies, like to be able to do that as well. But I, to me, it feels like a very rare thing to be able to succeed in. And so, you know, the, 
not all of the humor in the show is like necessarily oriented towards my sense of humor, but I feel like there is a pervasive, there is humor coming from the characters more than just from the Mm -hmm. situations a lot of the times. And, um, you know, and sometimes maybe some of that's even how they're dealing with the the difficulties that they face. Um, you know, and then as the show goes on, like it has, you know, spoilers, but like one of the best redemption arcs I've ever seen, maybe the best yep. even. Um, you know, it has um themes of like found family and it has animal, non-human animal characters who are characters and one of whom actually gets like a whole episode, you know, yeah. and um, and, you know, that episode is mostly devoted to his suffering, uh, which, you know, is, I think, says a lot about the world we live in and the way, you know, most humans look at non-humans. But, um, but like, that episode is one of my favorite episodes of any on-screen fiction. It's, like, up there with the epilogue of Justice League Unlimited, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and, yeah, that's that's most of it. You know, I'd say it's one of my three favorite series of all time, and yeah. I've rewatched it many, many times. And I deliberately actually didn't rewatch it this time because I kind of want to give a chance to the live action series to kind of live on its own separately in my mind. And we can we can circle back to Cowboy Bebop and how that kind of fits in with that, actually. Sure. And uh, Riki Hayashi, what about yourself? Hi, Riki Hayashi here. I... Did not watch this show originally when it came out. Uh, Only watched it for the first time maybe a couple of years ago and didn't know anything about it. I was familiar that they had made a live action movie, which was much panned. And that that was only that was like my cultural understanding of it Hmm. was that it was a cartoon and then a movie. And I didn't know anything about it. Fell in love with it almost immediately, like maybe like three or four episodes in. It really grabbed me. And it's. Lovely that it's only three seasons. Yeah. Yeah. They really tell a full arc in a concise way, which is one of the things I like. It, it doesn't linger too long and like have, you know, what people call filler episodes. And I too, like Paul, I identify strongly with the main character, Uncle Iroh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Obviously, the Aang is the main, you know, the main protagonist. But I, I think one of the beautiful things about this show is that so many of the secondary characters, like probably like six or seven deep, are really fleshed out and given their own arcs and given a chance to get to know them. And yeah. different people can can really identify with different characters in a meaningful way and gain some appreciation that way. So I I love this show. Yeah, I I, I very much agree with that. And I think that's where I'll start my conversation as well is saying I, I love this show for so many reasons. First and foremost, though, is the redemption arc of the character I most relate to and the one who I think is – if you go way back in the archives and listen to Paul and I talk about season one of Daredevil, we often talk about how the show comes like a hairbreadth away from making Kingpin the protagonist of the show. And in many ways, I think Zuko is really the second main character behind Aang. And it's his redemption story. And it's one that I feel, I think it says a lot about, you know, our relative positions that for me, that's the one I very much identify with. And I'll, I'll talk pretty uh, honestly about that because I've, um, and at the time that I watched it, that was really important because I will say that when I first heard about this show, I was still in a place where I kind of looked down my nose at animation. I, I really liked Disney animation and I thought there was a lot of like fun kid stuff. Like I loved the music from Little Mermaid and, and Aladdin and stuff like that. And I thought cartoons were fun, but I didn't look to them for serious discussion of the kind of issues that I liked. And there were a couple of shows that were recommended to me that I think really changed my perspective on that. And Paul was the main driver, I think, for all three of getting me to watch them. And they were Avatar The Last Airbender. Star Wars, The Clone Wars, and Batman, The Animated Series. And I will say the first time with this show, like, Paul, I really liked what you said about, like, finding that balance of humor, because I'll admit, I didn't, and I, and to this day, I still don't love the first season of the show, because my impression, at least, is that it does, 
the, the first season is a little bit more on the childishy slapsticky side of the humor, which is one that I just don't react well to. And so, it, and it does give me some trepidations about where we're going in season one. Although I do think that season one winds up having some incredible plot lines, but I also think that I, I did rewatch it the last couple of days, and one of the things that I really got out of it was that, to me, a big part of what the show is about is about the like I forget where I heard this first, but there's kind of an old there's an old cliche about like all of the terrible things that are life and you have to learn to be cynical and you have to learn to be, to not trust people that, you know, you can say children are idiots because they haven't learned that. Or you can say children are the one who should lead us because they haven't learned those things. And that, that innocence is such an important thing. And for me, that's a huge part of, I think what makes this story work so well and what makes Ang work so well is at least as I understand it, Ang is present. Mo most of the the kids are like early pubescent. I think they're supposed to be like thirteen to fifteen or sixteen. Um, with Ang being a little, with Ang being clearly youngest, and at least yeah, 12, and maybe even yeah, twelve, and maybe even chronologically, but um, closer. But you know, it, it seems like Zuko has gone through puberty. All of the people in Zuko's crowd have gone through puberty. Um, Katara has Sokka's in the middle of it. Aang hasn't yet. And for me, that's a big part of kind of what is able to set him apart and kind of make the humor uh, really work. Which, which I have a lot of thoughts about, but let me kind of stop there and let anyone comment or, or either what I said or what anyone else said. Well, I said 12, but he's actually 112. So Right, right. <laughs> You know. he, he has been frozen in carbonite, uh, forgive me, frozen in the South Pole, yeah. forgive me, frozen at the bottom of the map uh, for 100 years. Right. He has aged 12 years yeah. since birth. And to me, there's this um, sort of like this combination of, of wisdom and, you know, you could call it innocence, but I, I'm i not sure that's exactly the, the word I would use. But like, you know, over the course of the series, like he sees a lot of bad things and is confronted with a lot of situations where it's very difficult to not make, you know, the hard choice or whatever. And I mean, you know, because right. it's fiction, sometimes there might be like a third way. Right. And mm -hmm. but like, I think manages to come out of it still being the same person, which yeah. I, I think is often a lot of, you know, a lot of people tend to there's there's an idea that like a story is supposed to be about a character changing. Right. Yeah. And I, I think a story can be about a character not changing. Of course, and if you wanted to say it has to be about a character changing, then Zuko would be the main character, you know? Yeah. Um, but, and I will say as an aside that I do identify much more now with Uncle Iroh, um, maybe <laughs> partially because I resemble him more uh, in a shape <laughs> than at the time, uh, I, I didn't, but, um, but no, I mean, uh, Uncle Iroh is also one of my favorite characters of all time. And even if, Aang's my favorite protagonist. I can't say that I necessarily like him more as a character than Iroh. Like it's, yeah. it's, just, and there's, there's other characters in the show though, also that I think are such great characters that, um, kind of are, are, are unique. Don't feel like just like archetypes, you know? Yeah. And, um, in terms of, you know, the, the much maligned adaptation, one of the things that I think M. Night Shyamalan, who I believe wrote and directed it, said and was a producer like that he didn't want to have that kind of humor in mm -hmm. in the movie because he just didn't like that like he watched it with his kid and thought that there was a lot of great stuff in it but just didn't want to and i feel like you can't you cannot play that up as much as maybe the first season did you know you can like mm -hmm. try and not make it as much of it but i i feel like if you really try to ex excise that from the story yeah. I, I just think you're not going to get something that carries the same, I don't know, sort of like spirit as the show. So I don't know. I think you're, you're left necessarily with something fundamentally different that could be good on its own. But, um, I think you, you, I think you have to maintain some of the humor, some of the sense of humor of the characters, at least. Otherwise, they're just not the same people at all. In yeah. my view. No, I, I, I 100% agree. And I would say, Maybe childlike wonder is is the better word for him than innocence, and that he has this like they're in the middle of the war, and he's so like we have to go find the weapon, we have to go find the the thing that will allow us to win, 
but oh my god, here's this cool animal who I can like run on and right, like, right. You know, let's go penguin you know, sledding. Like, and, and I love the point you made about this being the story where the protagonist doesn't change because. I think if it's that the protagonist is unaffected by the events of the story, then that's often not great writing. Mm. To me, it's more that this is an experience that would be the darkening moment for so many characters. Like this is the, they get PTSD from this or they become more cynical or become, and to me, it's really about him. Not that he doesn't change because he's unaffected. It's that he is struggling so hard not to change and not to be changed by all the things that happen to him. Yeah, I think the strongest part of Aang's character is that he changes the world. I yeah. mean, obviously, as the hero, mm-hmm. like he saves the world. But what I mean specifically here is uh, we're, we're talking like full spoilers, right? Like we, we're just talking yeah, yeah. about what happens in this series. <laughs> At the end, in the finale, everyone's like, you have to kill Fire Lord Ozai, right? That's your destiny mm-hmm. as right. the Avatar. You have to kill him. And he chooses not to kill him. And that that is the moment of his heroism, in my opinion. That he yeah. makes this moral choice. And I you know, I'm not as satisfied with how he manages that with the magic of the now I know how to take away someone's bending. Like that seemed a little bit sudden. But I I really like that he makes that choice. And goes against the conventional thinking. I, like, it felt like he comes out of the ice. And to me, like, that echoes Captain America. And it's similar to in Civil War when he comes to that point of, like, when the world tells you to move, like, you say no, right? Like, everyone's mm-hmm. telling Aang you have to kill him. And he says, no, that's not the right thing yeah. to do. Yeah, I think I think it's really true. And I never really thought of it this way, but I think... One of the things that the show really does a great job of depicting, and it leads to what is probably my favorite single plot line in it, which we'll talk about, is the way that a hundred years of war have changed the world. Mm. And that, you know, most of these people are we're now multiple generations away from remembering a time of peace. And so just all of the hatreds of the other and all of the fears of we have to make sure that we have enough because we're in such scarcity and all that, Ang hasn't experienced any of that. Yeah. He he was frozen to the ice literally before the war started, and so he's not experienced any of that. Um, I want to shift gears a bit because this brings up what is, as I'm thinking about it, one of my biggest concerns about moving to live action, and I wonder if you guys are thinking about this as well. One of the points that I harp on all the time in this podcast is the idea that I'm often bothered when a TV show or a movie presents the idea that a character can choose to engage in violence that is quite, uh, you know, doing incredible damage to bodies, but that it is non-lethal. And that, you know, because I understand it, you know, a lot of times I'm like, I'm watching Batman do things to people and I'm like, yeah, that's blunt force trauma. That, that, uh, that, that, that person is dead. And so Batman saying like, I will not kill doesn't make any sense. Uh, same with Daredevil, a lot of these things. In this show, there are certainly a number of instances where Aang does things where I'm like, yeah, that person's not alive anymore. Except that the animation style is so... It's not trying to be realistic in the fight scenes. Like, the martial arts of it feels very realistic. But, like, people are constantly being thrown hundreds of feet and slammed into walls and slammed into ice in ways that would be lethal to a human body. In a way that I think works, and again, because of the animation style, which is a kind of like intentionally over the top, it feels to me like that's going to be very hard to translate to live action in a way that I think is believable that this much combat is happening, but that Aang is intentionally choosing to to never end a person's life. Um, What's your all thought on that? It, it, It can that work in live action? Paul, you're the martial artist. Right. (laughs) Maybe. I think I, I think it's a very good point. I think I think it's less about the animation style because the mm-hmm. the people move in very realistic ways. Like actually it, right. it's some of the best martial arts animation I've I've seen, you know, and they actually were right. informed by like real martial arts. And like mm-hmm. each, you know, style of bending, each nation has its own um specific, like real world style of martial arts that they they drew from. So it's not so much to me about like how people move. It's about when 
I mean, when I watch animation, I think when people watch animation, the brain is doing something different than when it's watching human bodies, like actual live action yeah. humans move through space, right? Like we are seeing representations that we recognize as representations of like the idea of a person. We're not seeing a physical person. Um, right. So I think, yeah, there's like, it's easier to accomplish that in animation where the idea of something that is potentially lethal, like I, in a lot of those things, I would say, no, that person's not definitely dead. But like, if you do that a hundred times, so, you know, yeah. sometimes it, it's going to result in death probably. Right. But in, in animation, because like, we're already looking at these kind of like avatars of people, um, mm -hmm. instead of like physical human bodies, I think there's a, a paradigm shift that's very easy to make work in, in the brain. Whereas with live action, that, that doesn't always, that's harder to accomplish. However, having recently watched, um, you know, some, some like Hong Kong movies, like Enter the Fat Dragon or like, like there's a lot of like kind of slapstick kung fu movies and mm -hmm. they managed to accomplish much the same thing where there is extreme violence that is just completely non-lethal. And I, I kind of think having that lightness, having that humor, be an element of like that pervades the entire production. I, for me, allows me to more readily accept that something is simply not lethal in the way that it would be in, in our world. And, That's fair. and so I think a show like Daredevil or maybe some sort of like the, the Dark Knight version of Batman, uh, maybe are a little harder to accept that these kind of this extreme, you know, hand-to-hand -hand violence can be non-lethal is a little harder to accept because it's this right. like dark, gritty, more real world feeling setting, right? Whereas yeah. when it's just clear that the paradigm that, you know, the, the, the show or movie or whatever is operating in has, you know, it's like, yeah, people survive that. You see someone survive at one time and then it's like, okay, that's, that's what we're working with. The, the things that bother me are when that's clearly the established paradigm. And then all of a sudden the writers want to kill off a character and they're like, okay, now physics and, and biology work differently because, yeah. you know, we want this to happen, you know? And then that kind of, that sort of shakes me out of the story. Cause it's like, well, I thought these were the rules and now you're telling me these are the rules. And so yeah. I would say they need to establish early on this kind of, you know, you could call it comic book violence. You could call it, you know, whatever you want, you know, animated violence or whatever, but sort of uh, establish the idea that like, yeah, you can, you can hit someone with a fireball and they're not just going to get burns to a crisp. They're going to get like knocked over, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, if that's how it plays, that's how it plays. I do absolutely agree though. Or I would say that it must be harder to achieve that in live action than in animation. Yeah. I would expect. Yeah, I, like, the thing with the bending is that, like, earth bending, they literally throw boulders <laughs> yeah. at each other, right? Like, that presumably mm -hmm. weigh tons, I'm gonna say. And then, like, fire bending, it's, it's just fire that they are yeah. hurling yeah. at each other. And there, there's a scene where Zuko accidentally burns Toph, right? Mm -hmm. Or the Aang accidentally burns Katara. Yeah. By barely touching them with some firebending. And yet when they're fighting yeah. with the firebending, they're just hurling at each other and, and like they put up their guard. It's like, it's still going to burn your, your forearms, right? Like you can hide your face, but your forearms are now singed. So I agree. Like the, the violence, you know, the, the fantastical violence, like as long as it serves the story, I think we can suspend our disbelief. I'm okay with that. And I, I prefer that. I actually don't like, uh, like realistic depictions of violence, like you said, in Daredevil. I haven't watched the show, but I've seen a clip where, um, Daredevil is literally like punching someone to death. Um, and I, I think I asked maybe Matthew, like, is this what the rest of the show is like? He's like, yeah, yeah, it's pretty representative. I'm like, that's just not for me. Like, I don't, I don't enjoy that. Yeah. But that and, guy was probably pretty... fine, by the way, because Daredevil doesn't kill people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. 
But that's part of the story, right? Like, that's yes. his story. Yes. And so when violence is used that way in stories, like, it, it bothers me. And I, I'm not saying that it's wrong. It's just, like, not my taste. So, like, sure. I'm, I don't enjoy that as much. Yeah. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think, um, you know, Paul, when you're talking about the style of animation, I, I guess what I mean is that I feel like there's some styles of animation that are trying to be kind of hyper-realistic, whereas this one is very much not. You know, so when you see, for example, like, the character getting very angry and in the very kind of like animation style, like you see like all the, like the, the colors around them change, yeah. their eyes bug out to five times. That obviously doesn't happen in real life, but it's a, a trope of a way to represent mm-hmm. that. Um, and I think you're right. I think if they keep the violence more on the, um, if they keep the violence more on the fantastical side, certainly because we don't have actual people able to throw fireballs and ice balls and rocks at each other, in our own world, I'm able to more, you know, understanding of that. I would say the scenes where Aang causes tanks full of people to fall off mountain cliffs, there's no degree of fantasy that's going to let me think that the people in that tank have survived. And so if we can maybe not have that exact scene, that's to me the worst. But I definitely think that, yeah, I, 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 I think we're all in kind of agreement that there are ways to do it in live action. It's just going to be something that I really hope that they're uh, aware. Because I, 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 I at least feel... That if I'm watching these things going like, oh, yeah, Aang killed that person. Aang killed that person. Katara killed that person. Aang's struggle about what which Ricky, you brought up, that I think is such a pivotal moment for his character, won't land as well. Right, yeah. In yeah. the final battle, the like part of the rest of the team is taking down airships. And it's like, if those crash, the, the occupants are just dead. Yeah, very much so. A bunch of them land in the water, though, I think. It's okay. like, so and this is a thing in animation that they the often G. do. The G.I. Joe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and they do that in the, you know, the old X-Men animated series, and they do that in yeah. the Justice. Like, they show the people, like, jumping out of the thing okay. before yeah. it crashes down. I mean, I like, think that is, like, a tele- – that could be, like, a television requirement. I, it could I remember be. hearing about G.I. Joe was that they they could not show anyone presumably dying. Right. So, like, yeah. any time a plane is shot down, they always have to show the pilot parachuting out type yeah. of thing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it was – as someone who grew up with that show yeah it was very ridiculous especially the tanks because like people always jump out of the tank right before it blows up it's like how did you know your tank was going to blow up yeah so let's talk about the individual characters because I think them and their journeys is 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 such an important part of the show Uh, and Riki let's start with you what is it about Iroh that you think of as like when you think about like what you have to do to get Iroh right, what does that mean to you? Oh gosh. I mean, first off, his voice actor is legendary, Mako Iwamatsu, and tragically he passed away, I think, after season one or like at the beginning of season two. And so there was a handoff to another actor. And it's noticeable, but uh the new guy, I can't remember his name. Uh, I think it's Greg Baldwin. Yeah, Greg Baldwin. Does a good job, like, as far as, like, trying to do someone else's voice. Uh, It's obviously very hard. But I I don't think it's as noticeable as, like, Clone Wars when Palpatine's voice acting changes. Yeah. (laughs) And and so there's just, like, a tenderness to the, the Iroh performance, you know, in contrast with Zuko and supporting that character. And you talked about the redemption arc of Zuko. I think it is supported and predated by Iroh's redemption arc, which is is largely told in flashbacks, right? That he was the the general, the dragon of the West, who assaulted Ba Sing Se and laid siege to it for 600 days and then failed to capture the city and came home and had a change of heart. And, and wanted to change the Fire Nation. And unfortunately, like, uh, at that point, I think Ozai had already taken over and taken control and banished Zuko and banished Iroh. And so he is also on this arc of not only trying to re- redeem his se- himself, like his own soul, but redeem his nation that he feels like he let down in, in, like, he, in failing to capture the city, but also in, leading this war effort i think is where he comes to is that not only 
did he fail militarily, but he failed to be the leader that the Fire Nation needed. And that's what he's trying to impart in Zuko in this story. And, and all of his lessons are, are just beautiful with Zuko. And, and he interacts with other characters and teaches them lessons as well. And it's just wonderful to have an antagonistic character able to play that role of mentor to your heroes. And I, I don't know. I mean, like the Tales of Bossing Say episode overall, like is is kind of medium, but his section is just like top tier to me. Yeah. And and that I, I think it's like five to ten minutes. But to me, like that's all you need to know about Iroh is in those in 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 that episode. And it's such a beautiful story. I cry, like I cry when Zuko comes and apologizes to him. It, it's just top tier storytelling to me and voice acting and it just works beautifully though it, i i i love iro and it's kind of like we we talk about aspiring to be like uh, heroes right and, and characters like we want them to be inspirational to me iro is inspirational as a example of positive masculinity yeah and just like non-violence, he, he he obviously like uses violence. He uses firebending. He fights, but I think he's reached a point where he's aspiring to a a life of non-violence. And at the end, when he says like, "After this is done, I'm just going to reopen my tea shop yeah. and live out my days," and I, I imagine like after that point, he only ever uses firebending to heat his tea, right? Mm-hmm. I, I never really thought of it until this moment, but I feel like there's an amazing. And probably very intentional um, mirroring between Aang and Uncle Iroh. That they're, you know, the youngest and the oldest of the main characters we spend time with. And, you know, I talked before about how, you know, Aang is the, the, the person who, no matter how dark things get, he's going to find pleasure in the simple joys of, you know, splashing around in the ocean and doing fun tricks and, and playing with animals and, and loving animals and, and relating to them. And Iroh strikes me as very much the same. And he's like, oh, well, okay, you know, we didn't find the the uh, clue that'll help us get to the enemy, but I did find a piece for the game that I want to play. And, you know, his love of, um, I want to call it, uh, uh, what, do you remember what the name of it? It's, it's kind of like an Othello Pie type show. game. Pie Show. Pie Show. It's like, it's Othello. I, I remember once reading it uh, from one of the writers, like Othello and Chess kind of mixed together. Um but uh, that game, his love of tea, and the there's one scene where him and Toph, who's part of the Avatar gang, but they don't know that they're part of these rival, you know, rival groups yet, meet each other and wind up. And he says, you know, there are few things in life better than sharing tea with an interesting stranger. And that sort of ability to find the joy and the love of the simplicity, I think, is so important to his character. And in a way, is, is really, to me at least, he feels very much a, a mirroring of Aang. Yeah, I feel like they're very two they're two very similar characters in terms of who they are inside and um kind of how they want the world to be and in a way how they see the world, but Iroh has seen a lot more of the world and was born in like almost an opposite setting, right? Like Ank Ang Ang grew up in in a monastery, you know, among a bunch of monks who basically, you know, sat around like hanging out with, um, well, and I mean, they're air nomads, right? So he traveled a lot as well, but like, you know, hanging out with sky bison and, you know, being friends with animals and being peaceful and, you know, exploring the world. Um, and Iroh grew up in the Fire Nation after it had been, you know, like hyper militarized and become an mm-hmm. empire. And, you know, I think he was the oldest son, right? And he was the one expected to carry on after, um, yeah. I forget Ozai's dad's name. Um, Azulon? Sozin. Sozin. He, his son was, Sozin's so- the... Oh no! You're yeah. right. You're right. You're right. So, so, Sozin is the, Sozin's so, Okai's grandfather. Sozin is the one who starts them on the path. Yeah, um, yeah. Azula, Azulon is, Azula is named after. Right, and then um, what's his name? Um, and then Ozai, and but so right. I think he, I think Iroh is like the oldest son. He's born into you know this family that's ruling this empire and is this very military force, and so. I think he becomes a general because that's what's expected of him. And he, 
and then he lays siege to the city. His his son dies in that siege, right? And yes. and I think maybe that's like the sort of triggering incident or whatever. But um, you know, Iroh's redemption story is is mostly backstory, right? It's mostly something that's already happened, and then he's able to facilitate Zuko's redemption story his redemption arc yeah but zuko's redemption arc is really like the conclusion in a way of iros where you know that like zuko's like oh you've got to go you know fight my dad basically and and iros like then history would just remember this battle as like one brother fighting another brother for control over an empire you know and yeah. like he was like You've got to do it, you know, and then he doesn't fight Oza, he fights his sister. But like it, you know, the point being that, like, I think it it took Iroh most of his life to get to the point where he was able to kind of become who he wanted to be, like who he was inside to like match his behavior outside in a way. And maybe he always had this kind of exterior of, I mean, I'm sure he always loved tea and pie show and like, you know, things like that. But like, he was an active general in an army that was trying to conquer other nations, you know? Yeah. And so I think, um, he, it, well, it didn't take him as many chronological years to kind of get everything to kind of match up the same way. Um, but like that, we, we get a character who's already gone through so much and we can, feel that in his actions but also i, I mean I, I think mako did a, a brilliant job of of like just bringing the character to life and making the character really yeah. feel and and so when you know when we're not going to talk about specific casting right but like as far as casting goes like that's one of the roles that to me like you you really have to get right because like the bar was set so high that I wouldn't want to compare someone to someone, but like too, too much. Right. But like, I, I think that's a very challenging role because there's so much depth from all this stuff that happened to the character that we, we just don't really get to see on screen, but we have to kind of feel it in a way. Wow. Yeah. I think it's really true. And, and you're right. The sort of love of tea and the kind of like simpleness is always there. And because there's one point where in a flashback we see Zuko and Azula um, being read ha – uh, their, one of their parents is reading them a letter that Uncle Iroh sent from the battlefield. Yeah. And he starts in a very like, I found a new kind of tea. It's wonderful. And and isn't this sweet? And, you know, I'm loving Uncle Iroh. And by the way, soon we'll be able to knock down this wall and and conquer these horrible people for the glory of the Fire Nation. And it's it's so glaring because it is still all of those things of Iroh mixed with this other, you know, the other stuff. Yeah. There's a, a very important moment in Iroh's character that, I, that I, I think is so important both for him and for Zuko, but I'm wondering how you two see it, which is that one of the things about Iroh and that one of the reasons I think why people so gravitate towards him is he really comes across as, you know, the person who will never turn their back on you. You know, they will always love you. They will always be there for you. You you don't have to worry about disappointing them. And, and there's so many scenes where he feel like Zuko, you know, does something that his uncle doesn't want and doesn't like. And, you know, when he comes back, he's like, uncle, you must be so disappointed in me or, you know, mad at me. And, and, and he's just like, no, I'm just, I was so sad that you were so lost. You know, these beautiful step minutes of love. But then in the, the beginning of the third season, Zuko is given a chance to turn his back on the Avatar, turn his back on his uncle, and rejoin the Fire Nation and take up the position of, you know, his father's right hand that he was trying so hard for in the first season. And then Iroh was so proud of him for letting go of his desire for that. And as a result, uh, Iroh was arrested and Zuko gets all his power and privilege and position again. And in this really beautiful scene... Zuko goes down to the prison to try and talk to Iroh and I think try to sort of say, like, look, I hope you understand why I did this. And Iroh turns his back on him and just refuses to talk to him. And I am not sure, is it supposed to be because even Iroh has a breaking point? And even Iroh has a point where he will say, like, I may love you, but I, I cannot support you. I cannot be there for you anymore. 
which I, I, I don't think would be a betrayal of the character. I think would be a very true thing for the character and, and a really important message of like, you know, we, you know, where we can go. Or do you think it is that he just strategically understands that anything he does, any kind of response he has is going to wind up coming off as enabling to his nephew. And that it is only by feigning a complete lack of any empathy or, you know, desire to relate to his nephew anymore that he can help give the nephew his push he needs to come back to like doing the right thing. Yeah. I, I interpret that as kind of Iroh's final lesson, which is that Zuko has to figure it out on his own. Mm. Like he, Zuko made the choice to betray the avatar, to betray, to betray Iroh and return to the fire nation. And so at that point he, he has the agency and he has to make the choice again later to betray his father and to to decide to join the Avatar's group. And Zuko, I mean, Z- uh, um, sorry, Iroh knows what has to happen for like Zuko's redemption, but he he can no longer tell him what to do anymore because it, it's kind of like him, Zuko, growing up, right? Like this is his mm-hmm. moment where he has to decide who he's going to be i think it's like literally words that he says earlier to him like you have to decide your own path i think he says in the moments before the betrayal at the end of season two and so like he's holding true to that and turning his back not saying anything because he's already told him what he has to do you have to decide your own path i i couldn't agree more um that's that's like exactly how how i've always seen it um and um i i think it's definitely not Iroh giving up on Zuko. I think he is deeply saddened that Zuko hasn't come to the conclusion he hopes that he will yet. Mm-hmm. Because I think that opportunity and a vision of what could be, what else could be, Zuko has seen, right? He has been able to see, right. okay, things can be different. I don't have to be the guy looking for the Avatar all the time. I don't have to be, like, my father's son, basically, in terms of, like, his heir to this empire. Um, so, Iroh showed him that possibility, and so did circumstance, right? Life brought him right. to the understanding that things don't have to be that way. But he also understands that there's there's a way that Zuko always had things in his mind of repairing, you know regaining his honor and like going back and then following in his father's footsteps, basically being at his side and then taking over here for him, presumably, even though we all know Azula would have been the one to take over anyway. But like (laughs) he, now he needs to see how things would be if he got his wish from the beginning and he needs to understand that's not really what he wants, you know? And I think Iroh, hopes that that's what will happen. I don't think he knows that will happen, right? I mean, I don't think you can know that will happen, but I think he, maybe he trusts that like Zuko has seen enough of the other possibilities that Iroh has given him everything that he can give him. And that now Zuko has to, he has to make the decision himself, right? It can't be Iroh talking him into it in a conversation. It has to be Zuko seeing things can be one way, seeing how things are the way he thought he wanted them and then deciding which way do I want them to be? Who do I want to be? You know, what role do I want to play in all of this? Um, and you know, and then, then he makes his choice and it's, yeah, it's and, great. Scene. And critically, like when Zuko makes his decisions, he has these like pretend conversations with Iroh. Like he does his bad Iroh impression. (laughs) He's like, what would Uncle Iroh say in this situation? And it's like, and he comes up with like very like BS philosophical sounding nonsense. Yeah. yeah. But it, it guides him on the right path. So it's like, even though the actual Iroh doesn't say anything to him at, at that point thereafter, he has the Iroh inside of him. Yeah. To guide him. Right. Yeah. And and that's really what teaching and mentoring is, I think. It's not about being with someone every step of the way. It's like giving someone as much guidance and wisdom and knowledge as you can and then yeah. leaving that with them. They they have that and they can take that with them and then use that in whatever capacity right. they can manage to. Right. Right. Like it's the classic, you know, devil and angel on your shoulders. But ultimately, like, even though you're having these pretend conversations with good and evil, it comes from within you. Yes. Like the final yeah. decision. Yes. Yeah. 
it's interesting because I see that scene so differently. Mm. For me, because for me, one of the keys of it is that at this is happening, Iroh is also like barely eating, and he's 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 like there's a later scene in episodes later where Iroh I think gets reminded that there is hope. I think someone gives him a piece from from the game, and he all of a sudden starts to you know train his body again and and think about escaping and things like that. But all that happens after this conversation with Zuko, and I took it not as him, probably not that he would consciously say that he's given up, but that he's lost a lot of hope. Like, I I, I kind of saw this as Iroh at his most broken because of how much he had thought that there, like, and I, I think a lot about his role in the family, that he is, you know... He has seen the brokenness of his entire family, and he is very much the the literal and, and as well as figurative outcast of the family. And yet Zuko has become his ally. Zuko has become the, like, no, I also see all the brokenness in the family. And then Zuko turns his back on him. And I, I, te- I love supportive, you know, characters like that who will catch people when they fall and be like, yeah, you did the really terrible thing here, but I still love you and all that. I guess for me, when that the degree of that becomes almost superhuman, it it, it kind of loses something for me. So, so for me, I think it's a very important moment that even Iroh has his limits of, you know, that he, it may be that he has some of that strategic thought in mind, but also that he he just doesn't want to, you know, show love and show forgiveness and 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 comfort to to Zuko at this moment because of all, you know, how he feels about it all. Um, and, I, and I think it is a, I imagine that, you know, in terms of the writer's intent, it was probably a lot more of what you guys are talking about, but maybe some of what I'm talking about as well. But I think it is a statement to how good the acting and the writing and the scene is that it's unclear, that it's like left is kind of like what exactly is happening here, particularly because there is no moment at the end where Iroh says, you know, please know I would have never turned my back on you. I only did that because you needed it. Like, there's, there's no sort of moment where Iroh explains his actions in that moment. Right. I mean, so first of all, I don't I don't see it as a hu- superhuman level of, like, not giving up on someone. Um, I, I find it very relatable in very mm-hmm. specific ways. But um, I... I, I do think he feels heartbroken and betrayed. Like, I think he was really hoping that Zuko was gonna, yeah. you know, not rejoin, you know, his dad with the Fire Nation and just gonna find his own way, a different way, you know? So I, I don't think he's like, he has no emotions about it. I don't think he's like, oh, yes, okay, well, uh, he just needs to go through this and whatever. But I, I, I think he has that understanding of that Maybe not that Zuko that this is what's gonna happen, but that like if Zuko is going to change his life, he's gonna have to be the one to do it. You know, mm-hmm. I think that's true. Um but and of course there's uncertainty. I mean there's there's always uncertainty. Right. I don't I don't think he has some like unyielding faith that Zuko that you know the goodness in Zuko is gonna win out or whatever. But right. I think I think that's his hope. And but I, I do think, I mean, I, I've, I've been in a situation where, like, I felt like I did everything I could to try and give someone whatever might be helpful of whatever I had to offer. And then they have to make their choice about what they want to do, you know? And, like, that's not I, – I didn't and I don't view that as giving up. I view that as, like, at the end of the day, people have to make their own decisions, Right, that's like I, I, I totally agree, and I think the the, the superhuman human comment was false. I, I get a better way, I guess, of saying it is of. I mean, it's. A, I feel like I, I, I row until this point has been able to, like, basically put his that his own emotional response to Zuko's actions were not going to be the focus. He was going to focus more on being a mentor sure. and a parent figure instead of having his own emotional reaction of "I am angry at you." And I think that that's what I'm more mean is okay, that that's yeah, the breaking point. Yeah. And I, I will just tack on, like, I don't really care what the writer's intent was. Like, if they say, yes, oh, sir. this is what we meant. Like, I, I don't care. I care what they put on screen. I am happy with my interpretation of it. I'm happy to hear other people's interpretations of it. I 
think it's cool that like different people can see it a little different, you know, like, I don't think that's a problem. I don't think that's necessarily like a deliberate, Oh, we want to make this vague. So, but I do think like anytime, you know, unless you have characters always just like speaking their motivation, like out loud every single time, which strikes me as usually quite poor writing. Um, there's always going to be room for interpretation. I think that's nice, you know, and I like that it, it allows more people to kind of, relate to characters and it allows more people to kind of draw something um, that they enjoy from it. And so I, I think, I think that's cool, you know, and good. Yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. Like when it comes to villains, you know, relatable villains that we identify with, it is often because their motivations are a bit murkier mm. and they don't just say mm -hmm. like, I want to do this because like, blah, blah, blah. Like those are what we often refer to as must mustache twirling. Right. right. Like, and so like, even in this story, the, the villainy of some of the characters, I think is interesting. Like Zuko, let, I guess we should transition to Zuko, right? Like often mm -hmm. related to Iroh, but Zuko starts this story out as a villain and he does have his whole, like, I have to capture the Avatar because my father. But but it's, I think there's something so relatable about the fact that it's his father, right? Like, it's right, right. Not, I mean, we, we have to, because <laughs> we all have fathers and um, not everyone has relationships with them but when you do like you you feel that like the di disappointing your father <laughs> is probably one of the most devastating like relatable things in in many of our lives i feel like and so part of the story of zuko is that for me the line that comes to mind is from uh guardians of the galaxy 2 at the end of that where um he says, he, he may be your father, but he'll never be your daddy, I think is the line, right? And like, <laughs> right. Ozai is Zuko's biological father, but in the end, he chooses Iroh as his daddy. He chooses the ideals of Iroh. And I think like that's that's what makes Zuko such a great character for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's really true. And I think, you know, I said before that Zuko is the character I most relate to because I think I've, I've been a pretty horrible person at various points in my life. And somebody I've talked to him about on this podcast and made decisions that, that hurt people quite a lot. And it's the fact that I think often one of the things I don't like about redemption stories is this idea that you, you have a moment where all of a sudden you're better. And now you have. You know, you've saved your son from the evil person or you've, you know, decided to, to do good and now everything is better and, and everyone accepts you. And Zuko really struggles to find redemption. He really struggles because, in part because it, it's not like there's a clear moral compass that he is rejecting and then deciding to accept again. He has been taught all of his life that finding your father's honor and being honored in the eyes of your father and your community is the moral good thing. And so he's looking for that. And it's the, he's questioning that and then, then going back on it and, and, and finding, you know, which way to turn. And uh, for me, the fact that he, his stumbles and they're like, he wants to do the right thing, but he, he wants to do the right thing, but he also wants to go back to do the comfortable thing. And that he wants to do the right thing, but isn't always sure what that is. And then that especially in the latter half of season three, when he really has realized that he can't be that person anymore and he wants to join with the Avatar and help the Avatar, and they don't welcome him with, with open arms. And there's one scene in particular that I really incredibly related to. Because one of the things that I, I found, and I've talked with others you know, who, who've had moments like this, of where like... I'm trying to show people that I'm not the person who I used to be and I'm trying to do the right thing. And I, 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 I don't want to get into the exact details of what happened in my own life, but like uh, there was a moment that I described as like, you know, if everybody knows you're an alcoholic and someone sees you drinking ginger ale in a dark bar and thinks that it's a beer, something that I did being seen by someone who doesn't understand the context or doesn't even know like a fa fact or two about it or, you know, misunderstood, whatever it is. But just that feeling of doing, 
trying to do the right thing and having it be seen as not as good as you think it is because you haven't really understood the depth of what you did wrong, incredibly relatable. But then that also happening of the doing the right thing, but having it be misunderstood because of the suspicion people have of you for very legitimate reasons and, and those things happening at the same time. And just the feeling of like, how, how do I deal with this? How do I seek redemption? Is it even fair to seek redemption? And the way that that's played out, and I, particularly I think because for so much of the show, the mom figure and the one who I think has almost as big a heart as Iroh is Katara. And the fact that it's she who is the, the last to accept him and the most hesitant to accept him, it plays so incredibly well. And I just think that there's just so much about that story that I, I, I think is very relatable both to people who have screwed up and are trying to do better, but also to the re- to ever, but also to all of us in terms of seeing the people who've hurt us, of that, that you can both recognize that a person's doing growth, but not... Ha- because I don't think that there's ever a moment where the Avatar crew is wrong not to open him with open arms, you know? And that that you can recognize a person's done better, but also recognize your own pain about the situation as such that you don't want them back in your life, or that it's going to take more to have them back in your life. Hmm. Well, that's heavy. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> like, no, I mean, it's very good. And mm-hmm. it's a lot to think about. Um, I, like, So here's here's the thing with Zuko. When we talk about redemption arcs or redemption stories, you know, we are Star Wars fans. We've talked about this a lot. We kind of dislike the Darth Vader and the Kylo Ren redemptions because they redeemed in death, right? Like it's, they, they don't have that moment with the other characters where they have to apologize and try to regain trust. And then in Rebels, we have the, the Callus arc where we do get that and we like that a lot. Here, it is, it's it's so brutal because Zuko starts as a villain and so like for the main cast like he's a villain like you, you have to redeem from that but he has the secondary arc in season two where he and Iroh travel to Ba Sing Se and he has this glimpse of a peaceful life he has that beautiful episode Zuko alone where he learns what the Fire Nation people think or the, the Earth Nation people think of the Fire Nation and even though he saves this kid this kid you know it's, has this built up racism and says like I don't I don't want your gift like you're from the Fire Nation I hate you even though you just saved my family right like th- that's very powerful and it's him kind of like learning about the world learning about himself and then at the end of that he f- he falls again, like he fails Iroh, he betrays Iroh and the Avatar. And that's what makes it so devastating and so redemptive to me, is that he starts as a villain already and has has a like upward curving path of redemption and then falls. And, and we have to go through that with him and then spend that, that part of uh, the first half of season three where Iroh's not talking to him, giving him the cold shoulder. And we're, we're devastated by that. And, and just to have that whole like roller coaster is what makes it so good to me is like, we, we have to have two redemptions essentially. Yeah. To me. And, and, oh, go ahead. And to finish up, like to have the, the avatar gang, I think there's like three episodes where he has to go on like little adventures with each of them with yeah. Aang, Sokka, and Katara. Yeah. And then Toph is like, I didn't get my <laughs> yeah, Zuko yeah. adventure. Zuko field trip. She literally calls it a life changing field yeah. trip with Zuko. Yes. <laughs> they, they dedicate three episodes to him doing penance, yeah. essentially, with the, the yeah. three main characters. There. I think four even, because the uh, Sokka one's like a two parter. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, I think, and, and the fact that it's, it's not four episodes with the whole gang because he's hurt each of them in different ways. Yeah. yeah. And and so that journey has to be individualized for each of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I think it feels like more earned than any other redemption arc I really can think of. Like, I mean, I'll say I love the Darth Vader redemption arc. Because even in Empire, I like kind of thought he was like the main character, right? Um, mm-hmm. But like, although I had seen Jedi first, maybe I'm not sure. Um, I was little, but like, I do feel the same thing where it's like 
I don't know. Maybe Darth Vader had to die so Zuko could live. But like, it's, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I love getting to see a redemption arc where the character not only lives on, but then tries to either atone or just, just make up for or cause not like he's not trying to undo the harm that he did. Right. He's not going around to help rebuild the villages that he incinerated. Right. That's not Mm -hmm. what he's doing. He's trying to. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Maybe he does that later. Yeah. But he's he's trying to he's gone from doing harm and making the world less like the way that, you know, the protagonists and the viewers Mm -hmm. mostly would want to see it and try to make the world more that way now. So, you know, it's kind of like, you know, kind of balancing the scales or whatever. But it's like it doesn't feel like that's why he's doing it. To me, it doesn't feel like he's seeking redemption. It feels to me like he understands who he wants to be. And now he just wants to do that. Right. And he does right. have to make things up and kind of square things with the other characters in order to really be accepted into their, you know, into team avatar. But like, that's not why he does. He doesn't do it. Cause like, it feels like, Oh, there's this score sheet. It's like, he wants to stop his father. Right. He wants to yeah. change the Fire Nation. And, you know, he grew up learning, you know, you're supposed to go fight for your country against the other countries, right? Against the other nations. But like now he's like, that's not how I want the world to be. Like we don't, the Fire Nation doesn't need to spread its goodness across the world. The Fire Nation can just be the Fire Nation. The Earth Nation can be the Earth Nation. And I guess Aang can just be the Air Nation for now. But like, you know, and the Water yeah. Nation. But, um, well, it's, there's no Water Nation, right? There's two Water Tribes. But the point being just that, like, it, it feels, the, the way he stumbles feels, it, do, to me, it doesn't feel contrived, right? It feels like super believable. If they tried yeah. to do that three or four times through like a whole bunch of seasons, like if this series went seven seasons and they said, okay, Z- Zuko can only like, you know, turn in like season seven, I think that might have been excruciating, you know? Yeah. And, and there's another series that I like a lot that has a redemption arc that is also very highly praised that I like, but did feel like there were a few too many of that moment in, you know? And, and I'm, I think the one, I think we're talking about Katra yes. from Shira. And I do praise it all the time. I do think that it has one too many of them. Right. Yeah, so like absolutely. it can be both, right? It can be great, but yeah. also just, you know, they had a certain number of seasons and here it's like, maybe they were going to do four seasons and then do some stuff after the end of this. But like three seasons felt so right for this show. It felt mm-hmm. like a disciplined, like, this is the story we have to tell. We're going to tell that story. And, and they did. And it wasn't such a long story that like, you had to just keep dragging out like Zuko's arc. You know, it's like instead yeah. you got to kind of hit to me what felt like just the right number of points. Right. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's something about a trilogy that often works well. You know, the end of the second one is the low point, not just for the heroes, because like Aang just got blasted by a lightning bolt in the back when he was in the Avatar state. And now his chakras are all jammed or whatever. But, like, it's a low point for Zuko because he's achieved what he wanted to achieve, but that's not what he really wants or should be doing. Right. Right? So. I I think that's so true. And actually, one one of the things I think is so essential about what he's doing at the end there, because you're right, it's not just that he wants them to be forgiven for his own well-being. It's, I want to help. Yeah. And until this point, he's had a real, like, I need to be the fighter. I need to be the one. And him having this moment of the best way I can help is not to be the one to take these people on. It's to help train Aang so that he can be the one. That also just feels like such an important shift for him of it it, it kind of meta level. It's sort of like for most of the show, these two have each had their point of view story. And it's him being like, you know what? I'm not the main character. Yeah. I'm okay. I'm going to step back and be this, this secondary Secondary, but incredibly important role. And, like, who's his role model that he's chosen to take on as his sort of figure? Iroh. Iroh. And what did Iroh do? Iroh decided, I'm going to spend this part of my life trying to help someone else become who they can be. You know? So, like, Zuko is literally passing on that same lesson. That same, like, okay, 
Iroh gave me everything he could so I could be the best me that I could be. Now I'm going to try and give Aang what I have to give so that he can be a fully realized avatar and, you know, kill my dad. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, there's one other thing I want to add just on that, which is kind of go back to the what's happening with Iroh in that scene moment, but then we can move on, I promise. But it goes back to, Riki, something you said about how Iroh is both wanting to help um, Zuko find redemption but also wanting to redeem himself in some ways for like his role in all the terrible things that the Fire Nation did and to help change the Fire Nation. For me, I think the, that's the other part of that. Because the other thing that happens there is that once he does begin training, what he's doing is preparing himself to go be part of the White Lotus Society, which we learn he's really the head of, which is going to do its own thing to help fight the Fire Nation and liberate the Earth Kingdom. Specifically... To yeah, to, to liberate the city li- that he was trying to conquer. Exactly. That his nieces that his niece wound up then actually conquering yeah. with his nephew's help. And I think so to me it, it again, I agree with you, it's, it's not turning his back necessarily on Zuko, but I think it is a moment of his saying that until now I have felt the best thing I can do to help the Fire Nation is to help Zuko be the person the Fire Nation needs. Mm-hmm. Now I hope Zuko can become that, but I'm going to go off on my own quest to focus on making the Fire Nation what it should be and, and fixing the harm of the Fire Nation right. rather than focusing on Zuko. Yeah. Well, we need to keep moving on to some of the other characters and plot lines. And I'm also going to say this because we're going to go a while. So this is going to be the end of part one. To our listeners, we're going to have a second episode. Uh, we're going to record some bonus content at the end of that second episode, which might get broken up over the two, or it might just be at the end of the second one. Uh, we have a lot more to say, so I can't really say we have spoken. I will say uh, we are in the midst of speaking. Thank you so much. Winner!